Welcome to November. It's the first Friday of the month, and on this day in history, in 1981, our neighbor Antigua and Barbuda achieved independence, marking the end of nearly 350 years of British rule. Today we'll dive into a mix of our own history, current affairs, and cultural preservation, all packed into this installment of Jamaica Magazine. I'm Audrey Williams, and I'll be right back after the news. Good day, I'm Theodore Henry, and this is your JIS News for Friday, November 1, 2024. Residents of Catherine Hall and surrounding areas of St. James are happy for the opening of a new-look Catherine Hall Health Center. The facility was refurbished and expanded at a cost of $57 million under the Ministry of Health's Operation Refresh program. Minister Christopher Tufton, who recently opened the upgraded health center, says it's part of a broader mission. We are refreshing and recategorizing our primary health care facilities to make them more comfortable, to make them more user-friendly, both for staff and patients, and to enhance the customer service experience. Upgrading of the Catherine Hall Health Center was financed by the National Health Fund, NHF. It now offers additional services and less waiting time, with the number of clinician rooms increasing from two to six and more doctors being employed. Four consultation rooms have also been added in addition to an isolation room, cold storage for vaccines, and expansion of the pharmacy, health records, and dental areas. And we have offices for the following that were not here before. Environmental health, our social worker, parish NCD officer, a clinical room for a public health nurse, nutrition and our valued CHAs. We have a brand new lunch room, brand new conference room. We have expanded the waiting area for not just one, but two waiting areas and a reception hall. The Airports Authority of Jamaica, AAJ, has identified a site for the establishment of the country's fourth international airport, which is to be located in Negril, Westmoreland. The development follows the recent announcement by Prime Minister Dr. Andrew Holness that an international airport would be built in the resort town. President and Chief Executive Officer of the AAJ, Audley Diedrich, explains that the directive given to the authority by the government was to determine the extent to which the Negril Airdrome could be upgraded to an international airport. We engage consultants to do the necessary studies, and out of those studies it has emerged that the present aerodrome is not suitable for development of a major international airport, taking flights or aircraft of the size of, say, the 737s, which is the most common um, airline aircraft utilized for transport now. With the Negril Aerodrome ruled out as a suitable site, Mr. Diedrich says plans are being crafted for the development of the international airport elsewhere. This is expected to alleviate the challenges related to traffic and road conditions that tourists flying into Montego Bay face. In addition to catering to tourism traffic for the Negril uh, uh, facilities and, and properties, an airport we posit in that part of Jamaica will also open up the western part of Jamaica to various forms of further international development, economic development, I'm sorry. Mr. Diedrich was addressing a recent GIS think tank. The government is in talks with the World Bank regarding the development of another disaster risk financing instrument for Jamaica to further limit the impact of natural disasters on the national budget. Chief Fiscal Economist in the Ministry of Finance, Teron Francis, says discussions are underway towards developing a catastrophe-deferred drawdown option, CAT-DDO, 
for Jamaica. CAT DDO is a financial tool that allows countries to access immediate funding from the World Bank after a natural disaster. Mr. Francis emphasizes, however, that while the Contingency Fund and CAT DDO are vital resources being pursued, they should be drawn down only as a last resort to minimize increasing the public debt. We have made ex ante preparation to ensure that adequate resources are available to finance natural disasters when they do occur so that we can preserve the gains that we would have made over the years from the many sacrifices that Jamaicans, all Jamaicans, would have made over the years. Mr. Francis was addressing a town hall on Jamaica's comprehensive disaster risk management policy held at the Girl Guides Association of Jamaica headquarters in St. Andrew, recently. Residents of the St. Anne Northeast constituency were recently given clarity on plans for a number of roads in their communities as government continues its consultations on the SPARC program. Recently elected Member of Parliament for the area, Matthew Simuda, assured concerned residents of the Ocherias and Exchange communities that upgrading works were planned for the Chin Street, Harrison Town and Church Street roadways. Church Street in Eltham is a part of a program called the REACH program. The REACH program is a patching and restoration program. So in the coming month, it will benefit from $2 million of restoration work. Harrison Town is also a part of the REACH program. So significant patching and restoration work will take place right throughout Harrison Town. He explains that piping work had been set to begin on Chin Street on Monday, but that was delayed by the weather. That contract contemplates full restoration of the work after the new pipes are laid, including the laterals. So it will be up to the citizens to sign up as quickly. They're supposed to be in Chin Street for those who don't have connections. Those who do will just be transferred to the new system. But Chin Street will be fully restored by the end of the year after the piping work is done. The Ministry of Agriculture has introduced an initiative called I Pledge to Eat Jamaican, urging citizens to commit to eating at least one meal made entirely from local ingredients each day in November. Portfolio Minister Floyd Green introduced the pledge during the official launch of Eat Jamaican Month on Thursday. This Eat Jamaican, we really need to show our farmers how much we appreciate them by ensuring that every day in the month, we are eating Jamaican. Eat Jamaican Month, which was launched on a farm in Linstead, will also feature a backyard gardening campaign aimed at promoting local farming. Applications for the program will open this month on a first-come, first-served basis. So we're going to be doing that. The other thing we're going to be doing in our backyard gardening program is going to start some vertical farms. So we're going to be distributing not just the regular backyard gardening kits. But if you see now, you don't need a lot of land to be a farmer anymore. There are also plans for a school jingle competition and a TikTok cooking challenge to engage young people and spread the message of eating Jamaican. The ministry will also collaborate with the Jamaican Consulate in Miami to promote Eat Jamaican Day on November 25. A diaspora logo competition will also be launched to further raise awareness and encourage participation in the initiative. And finally, a call to action has been made for young people to harness their influence and make meaningful contributions to their communities. This is the main focus behind this year's National Youth Month observation, being celebrated in November under the theme, Youth Impact 2024, Elevative Minds, Purposeful Action, Collective Triumphs. The Ministry of Education and Youth, through its Youth and Adolescent Policy Division, is coordinating a series of activities island-wide. Youth Impact 2024 will embody empowerment and agency, action and responsibility, leadership and innovation, collaboration and inclusivity, measurement of progress and legacy. Highlights of the planned Youth Month activities include the 15th sitting of the National Youth Parliament, roundtable discussions, Ponder Corner initiatives and consultations on the National Youth Policy. There will also be workshops on student leadership and governance and the National Youth Forum. In tandem with Youth Month, November also serves as Parent Month, with this year's theme being Surf Beyond the Surface. It will focus on encouraging parents to engage in discussions about parenting and artificial intelligence. 
And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Theodore Henry. Thanks for watching. One of the things we need to remember is that there are many persons out there in our family, community, wider society who may be having challenges and that these persons sometimes need to be heard, sometimes need to be helped, sometimes need to be hugged, right? And the best we can do to promote mental wellness in our community is just to be there for people, to be able to hear them, to be able to hug them, to be able to help them, you know? And let's all be our brother's keeper and make this place a better place and uh, a place that is conducive to good mental health and mental wellness. As we celebrate our annual Science and Technology Month this November, I'm honored to address you in proclamation of the theme Innovation for Sustainable Development. This theme resonates deeply within our nation as it highlights the critical role that innovation plays in shaping a sustainable future for Jamaica. In recent years, we have witnessed the profound impact of science and technology on every aspect of life across the world. From renewable energy initiatives to advancements in telecommunications, Innovations have greatly defined economic competitiveness and inclusivity and have the power to enhance the quality of life for all Jamaicans. Our commitment to sustainable development is now more important than ever. We continuously face challenges such as climate change, resource depletion and social inequalities. However, those challenges also provide us with the opportunities opportunities to innovate and create solutions that drive our nation forward. It is our responsibility as the Ministry of Science, Energy, Telecommunications and Transport to provide legal and policy frameworks that will guide innovation and development across the science, energy and telecommunications and transport sectors. Our enabling policy environment through the science, technology and innovation policy addresses the urgency for innovative solutions in the local space by using science and technology at a critical time when the world is currently grappling with pressing challenges. Jamaica, innovation has always been a catalyst for human progress. However, innovation does not solely rest in the government. It thrives on the spirit of our entrepreneurs, our researchers, and our students. We must foster a culture of creativity and ingenuity. Let us encourage our young minds to dream big, to think critically, and to innovate fearlessly. Education through STEM is a cornerstone of, of this endeavor, and we must equip our future leaders with the tools they need to navigate a rapidly changing world. With these considerations, the Ministry of Science, Energy, Telecommunications, and Transport, in partnership with the Scientific Research Council, the International Center for Environmental and Nuclear Science and the National Commission on Science and Technology invite you to join in celebrating Science and Technology Month 2024. As we embark on this journey towards sustainable development, let us deliberately embrace collaboration. I urge business, academic institutions and civil society to join forces. Together, we can expand Jamaica's view of science and harness our collective knowledge and resources to create solutions to drive local development through inclusion and innovation. Thank you all, and I urge you to show your support by sharing in the celebrations for Science and Technology Month 2024. Thank you for staying with us. Our next feature highlights a young visionary in arts and literature, showcasing how he transforms his experiences into a force for good. Reading.
reading is vital for a multitude of reasons. It enhances knowledge, improves vocabulary, and boosts critical thinking skills. In our fast-paced world, it's essential to reflect on the significance of reading in our lives. The chicken, the frog, and more serves as a poignant reminder of how reading acts as a guiding signpost through life. It helps us navigate challenges and explore new ideas, much like following road signs on a journey. Let me draw you a little picture. Let's just say you, were, you had to drive from Ligani to Montique Bay, and you did not know where you were going, and you needed signs to point the way. If you could not decipher those signs, you will not be able to find your way. Reading is like that through life. It allows us to find our way in many ways. It builds our comprehension. It helps us when we need to communicate with each other. It helps us when we need to build our imagination. Reading is a critical life skill. Oh, The Chicken, The Frog and More presents everyday scenarios in a relatable way, offering valuable life lessons through a variety of engaging stories. In a heartfelt narrative, young author Jotham Samuels shares his inspiring journey into writing and storytelling through his book. It reflects his journey of overcoming bullying, transforming his struggles into engaging narratives. I started writing at six years old. I actually had a homework assignment about writing and um, I, wrote, I wrote some stories for, for each homework assignment and I thought it would be a good idea to start writing, to start publishing them. So first, I got the homework on one, on one like um, Wednesday day or something and then I wrote the story because, because, I, because I always keep on getting bullied by some, of, by some of the people in my class and I thought that would be a good idea to so it inside of some like cartoon setting. This spark of creativity led him to gather his tales into one book with the support of his parents. The Chicken and the Frog. It was a hot, sunny day. Mr. Frog was having a bath in the pond. He was having fun, enjoying the cool water. Then he heard someone laughing very loudly. It was Miss Chicken. The next day, Miss Chicken was out looking for seeds. Suddenly, a man grabbed her and put her into a bag. She began to call out for help. So I wrote the story. Then after that, I got other homework assignments on each on different days. And then that's how I got the other stories. And I told my mom, wouldn't it be a good idea to, to publish all of these stories into one book? Then my mom agreed on it. And now we have the chicken and the frog. Jotham's journey didn't stop at writing. He found that revisiting his stories deepened his love for reading. How did I start liking reading? I wrote this story and then I read back through the story and I actually felt engaged inside reading. Then I started reading more and more. This charming tale resonates with readers of all ages, reminding us that our stories have the power to inspire others, no matter how young we are. Through the lens of Jotham's experiences, we see that reading and storytelling are not just hobbies. They are vital components of personal growth and connection. Let us remember that every story has the potential to guide us, ignite our imagination, and inspire the next generation of storytellers. All children deserve positive parenting. Why not pamper us? Be patient with us. Make time to teach us and, of course, play with us. Celebrate milestones with us and don't forget to be our number one supporter. Do all these things and practice positive parenting today. Homeschooling may seem challenging to many, but for this family, it's a way to preserve their cultural heritage while maintaining a structured curriculum. Let's take a closer look at their teaching and learning process. Meet Ronalda Pearman, homeschooling mother who makes learning an adventure for her child, Tanama. 
With creativity and enthusiasm, she turns everyday lessons into explorations, showing her dedication to making education both fun and personalized. Together with her husband, Robert Pearman, they ensure that their six-year-old, Tanama, is given the necessary tools for her homeschool journey. My Taina ancestry and cultural practices is what really was the driving force behind homeschooling because as you know now there is the extinction narrative that all the Tainos died out. However, we aren't obviously and so it was very important to me that my child learned her ancestry and also live the life of it. And so school for me, you know, that was the first Public school for me was the first barrier that started to come up in terms of if they're teaching her that she's she's dead, she's going to have that continuous struggle to continue to defend who she is. And so it was very instrumental in continuing the legacy in the capacity of homeschooling. It is extremely important that I have a schedule or a routine that is flexible, that will allow for life. And so the morning routine will begin from say 7.30. We greet the sun as a part of our cultural practice. We give gratitude. And then from there, we'll move into family discussions in our own little devotions. We'll have breakfast, but sometimes breakfast is probably her even assisting me in the kitchen. I also um, get to structure screen time. So if screen time is probably like three hours for the day or two hours for the day, then for those screen time, it is very educational and she's learning something from it. Structured learning is from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. and then from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. it's just outside. So where she's running up and down, she's catching butterflies, she'll learn about the leaf of life, she'll learn about lemongrass or fever grass, aloe vera slash single bible. Um, she will, you know, I, right now I have little holes in the yard where she'll dig up and break piece of my plants and plant them, you know. Just her learning about the earth, the soil, you know, the different parts of the tree, a tree life, insects. Games are fun, hands-on, interactive and educational. They teach so many skills. So what we do is we ensure that we incorporate games education into her curriculum and the objective of this is that she has an opportunity to lead in some of these activities. She chooses the games that she wants to play and we ensure that the options that are available are those that will develop various skills that she will have, right? Problem solving, um, calculation, various things. Creating your space, I should make a point, is solely the responsibility of you and your child because it doesn't make sense to create a space where the child finds uncomfortable. Learning will never happen there. So have a conversation with the, with the child. You know, you're, you're having, you have these learning posters. Is, does she find it scary? Does he find it attractive? Does he want to look on it and point or um, reinforce a lesson that he's learned previously and say, oh, so this is what is there. Um, your learning space doesn't have to be big either. If it is just a small room or a little square, that is solely between you and the child because learning takes place everywhere. The Jamaican government's um, education curriculum is one of the best in the world, my opinion. Um, it is very, it's very fulsome. Um, it, it, you, you get a lot from it. However, sometimes the tools in which you use to communicate that information to the child may be a little bit lacking. And so sometimes we will have to use a different curriculum to, um, as, a, as a tool to, to, to navigate those spaces and in terms of giving the child what they need. So for me right now, I'm working with the Ministry of Education curriculum. 
I've termed it traditional cultural studies because we don't just um, teach her Taino culture but also our maroon heritage culture and we have a very good relationship with the Windward Maroons that's Charlestown, Scottsall and Moortown Maroon community and so they also come to our events we also go to all of their events I don't want her to miss out on those how do I um, decompress I do gardening I have my gardening time where I'll you know ask my husband to what, no, while they're doing their arts and craft or game schooling, I'm outside, one with the plants. Another way I decompress is painting and coloring. So, and, and I have my self-care journal. A part of home education, I want to make this very clear, it is not about educating the child, but everyone in the household, because we're all learning from each other and we're all learning from interaction. So it is critical to view home education not as something isolated and separate from a public system, but it is an integral part that should be added to any type of curriculum or education plan for children of all ages. Anybody who is going to take on homeschooling must have self-care as a part of their routine because it can become intense. If you know as a homeschooling parent that you're reaching to that point and you have nobody to, 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 to get a break with pause. A pause is better than reaction. Washing your hands properly can help keep you and others safe. Remember to wash often, especially before eating or touching your face. Addressing agricultural crime and protecting our farmers is a key mission for the Ministry of Agriculture and the Security Forces. So, the Jamaica Constabulary Force has launched a recruitment drive for agricultural wardens. These wardens will undergo an extensive training program and will be stationed in Pradio Larceny hotspots across the island. It's all at a projected cost of $1.8 billion over three years, including $390 million in the first year. If you're interested in becoming a warden, here's what you can expect. Our first 100 agricultural wardens, once recruited, will participate in an extensive training program to include, among other areas, enforcement models, fundamentals of police duties and procedures, firearm training, defensive tactics and drills, community-based policing, evidence recording, court preparation, target hardening, and agricultural modules. We've reached the end of our program. Get a recap of everything you saw here and more on our website, gis.gov.jm. I'm Audrey Williams. Bye for now. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.